Uh, so today we're going to kind of talk briefly about home hydroponics. Um, again, kind of like all these others, just kind of a brief overview. Um, so, Katie, if you want to go to the next slide. So some of the things we're going to talk about, uh, some of the different hydroponic systems that are out there, some of the growing medias that you could potentially use if you're going to pursue hydroponics, some of those growing conditions, uh, what we need to do about nutrients, um, and they kind of sprinkled throughout this. Uh, we'll give examples of some of these different systems uh, as well. So we go to the next slide. Uh, so first off, this is probably review for everybody, but what exactly do plants need to grow? So obviously they're going to need um, water, and when we're doing hydroponics, we're growing plants in water, so we will have plenty of that. Uh, they're going to need air, uh, not only carbon dioxide, but also oxygen. So in some of our hydroponic systems, we're going to have to provide some air uh, to the roots. Obviously, they're going to need light. Um, normally, at least here in Illinois, uh, when people are doing hydroponics, typically we're doing this indoors. Uh, a lot of times during the winter um, when we can't grow stuff outdoors, that's typically when I do hydroponics. Um, during the growing season, <clears throat> I focus on outdoor stuff, but then uh, come fall and winter and early spring, um, I, I'll do my hydroponics. Uh, nutrients, uh, since we are not growing plants in soil, um, we are going to provide all those nutrients, so that's going to be important for hydroponics. And then uh, support as well, since again, if they're not growing in soil, they don't have that support uh, that soil would typically provide. So in some cases, we need to, may need to provide some support uh, to plants too for growing taller plants. Uh, next slide. Uh, so like I mentioned, hydroponics is going to be a way of growing plants um, without using soil. And we're going to be using basically nutrient solution, kind of fer basically fertilizer in that water to provide all those nutrients that the soil normally would for those plants. Um, when we're doing hydroponics, the roots of those plants are either going to be suspended in that water. Um, the, they may be in that growing media and we may pump up some of that nutrient solution, let it drain out. So we'll flood it and let it drain. Uh, they could be misted. We could have a pump that's continuously bathing those roots uh, in that nutrient solution. So there's a variety of different ways we're going to deliver the, that new, those nutrients uh, from the hydroponic solution uh, to the roots of the plants. Um, a lot of times when people are doing hydroponics, they're going to use something like a Hoagland's or a Clark solution. Um, and those are just some of these nutrient solutions that have been uh, kind of designed that have all of the mi macro and micronutrients uh, that plants need to grow and kind of um, set concentrations that are good for, for most plants to grow in. Right, go to the next slide. Um, so some of the, the benefits of growing hydroponics is that we get we tend to get much more rapid plant growth. Uh, so in some studies, uh, we get 30 to 50% faster growth when compared to plants kind of growing in the soil because we can tailor, we're typically, we're gonna be tailoring um, these conditions to the plants you know, we're providing um, ideal uh, temperatures we have plenty of moisture. We can tweak those nutrients so that we, again, we have those ideal levels of nutrients. Um, the plants aren't growing in soil, so they're not spending energy uh, growing out, exploring the soil um, for those nutrients. They're all being kind of spoon fed to them. So they're, more of that growth is going into uh, leaf production or fruit production, stuff like that. And because we do get faster growth, a lot of times we will get greater yield. Um, they'll start yielding sooner um, and over a longer period of times. A lot of cases, especially if you're growing indoors, you don't have to worry about um, cold temperatures or really hot temperatures affecting the growth of those plants. Um, it's also a good way to avoid some of our soil borne pathogens or insects. Again, we're not growing in soil, so we're kind of eliminating those right off the bat um, from, from these kind of production systems. Um, if you live in an area where you have contaminated soil, so a lot of times larger cities, uh, you may have lead contamination in the soils um, that can cause issues. You live in, a, in an apartment or something like that where you don't have access to a lawn or a yard where you can grow stuff. Um, hydroponics could be used. Uh, you're seeing more and more in, uh, again, larger cities, um, in abandoned factory factories and stuff, converting those into hydroponic grow systems where you have uh, basically stacks and stacks of, of hydroponic system set up for food production. So again, allowing you to grow in places where you may not typically be able to grow uh, plants. Um, and since we're growing these plants in water, it may seem kind of counterintuitive, but we typically are going to be using less water when using hydroponics um, because again, we are we are delivering that water directly to the plants. When you think about when you're growing outdoors, you know, you have your tip, a lot of times you're watering your whole garden, that water is going to spread out um, throughout that, that landscape. Um, so there's some wasted water. It's not being directed 
um, directly to your plants. Um, so again, we're kind of tailoring that water to those plants and typically we're going to be using a lot less water when using hydroponics. Uh, next slide. Um, but hydroponics is not all unicorns and rainbows. There are some drawbacks to this. Um, a lot of these systems are going to be active systems. So they're going to require pumps or something like that. So if you lose electricity, you don't have any power, you don't have water getting to your plants, uh, your plants are going to die. Um, so that can be an issue. Typically, there's going to be more costs associated. You know, you're growing outside, you dig a hole in the ground, put your plant in, uh, and you're good to go. Uh, with hydroponics, there there is going to be some initial um, setup costs that are going to go with this. You're going to have to buy your your growing media, um, set up those systems, you know, purchase a pump potentially, uh, things like that. Um, they are going to require a little more management. Um, again, you're going to have to monitor those those water levels. Uh, nutrients, nutrient levels, uh, stuff like that. And in some cases, because we we are growing in water, there is that potential for uh, more disease issues. If we were to get some of the the, the waterborne pathogens into um, into our water, into our nutrient solutions, and that can then spread rapidly throughout our hydroponic system, and that and that could be potentially devastating. Doesn't happen a tremendous amount, but there is that potential for that as well. Uh, next slide. So, you know, we as humans, we like to classify things. So there's a lot of different ways we can classify our hydroponic systems. So we have our active systems. So with these, we're actively moving that nutrient solution around. Um, in that system, typically we're going to be using a pump to do this. Uh, we also have some passive systems. Uh, so you know, these are not, don't kind of have any moving parts. We may be using a wick for capillary action to move that nutrient solution up. We may be suspending those roots in that solution. Um, there are a couple different ways that can be done. Um, and then we can also classify hydroponic systems as to whether or not we recover um, that nutrient solution. So our recovery, if that's a recirculating system, um, we're going to be re re reusing that nutrient solution. So we may pump that up uh, into that growing media, drain it out and collect it and kind of continually reuse that. Um, our non-recovery systems, basically we will apply that nutrient solution to our growing media and we are, we're not concerned about uh, capturing that again. So next slide. So some of the different systems that we have, uh, first off the WIC system, this is probably the, the simplest one to do, probably the easiest, um, less co least cost associated with it. So this is gonna be a passive non-recovery uh, type system. So we don't have any pump, we don't have any uh, moving parts. So you can see in this picture, they've taken a, a plastic water bottle, cut that in half um, and use that to, to create this system. Uh, so with this, we've got our nutrients in that bottom reservoir there, and then we have uh, some kind of WIC, whether that be a a candle or a lantern wick, a piece of fabric, something like that, going from that nutrient solution up into that growing media where we have our plants. And that nutrient solution will travel up that wick, again, by capillary action. The growing media, uh, Katie will get into this in a little bit, but we can use sand, perlite, vermiculite, uh, that soilless potting mix, uh, what have you, uh, for this particular type of system. Um, one of the drawbacks to this, though, is that uh, this system tends to keep that growing medium a little on the moist side, a little on the wet side. So, you know, this probably would not be a system you'd want to use for succulents or something that does not like having wet feet. Um, you know, think of something like more like a mint that likes uh, real moist conditions and, and can tolerate those rather well. Uh, so next slide. So our, our next one is going to be a floating raft um, and we'll have a We'll paint the picture here and then we'll show you pictures in the next couple of slides. So this is another passive system. So with this, a lot of times you're going to have a piece of styrofoam with holes cut in it with the plants in those holes and those roots are going to be uh, again suspended in that water. So they're going to be constantly um, in that water. Again, this is another low cost, uh, low maintenance uh, type system. There are a few things you'll have to think about because those roots are suspended in that nutrient solution. You will have to provide some aeration to those roots. Um, you know, they, those roots need air in order to survive. So if you don't have that, basically those roots will eventually drown and the plants will die. Uh, you do need to keep that nutrient solution dark. Um, so you, you need to cover that up. You know, a lot of times when people are doing this at home, they use like a 10 gallon aquarium to do this. You need to cover up those slides because you'll get a tremendous amount of algae growth if you get um, any light in that nutrient solution. So making sure you can, can reduce as much light as possible getting to that nutrient solution. Um, and because these plants are 
are growing in a raft, you may need to provide some plant support, especially if you're growing larger plants uh, so that that raft doesn't sink. Uh, typically, when this is done, you're going to be growing something like lettuce, like a loose leaf lettuce, bib lettuce, uh, something like that. That's a little bit of a smaller plant. Um, so next slide. So you can see here uh, kind of how this is set up. So they have this styrofoam uh, board. They've got holes in that and then put uh, these plants in there. They started these, it looks like in rock wool uh, cubes. And you can see that green stuff on those cubes. That's algae growth in there. Um, in hydroponics, you know, algae growth is, is almost unavoidable. You've got nice moist conditions with lots of nutrients. Um, you're going to get algae growth. You're just you're, a lot of times you're just trying to minimize that um, in these systems. Uh, so next slide. Um, here's one um, a little more kind of DIY type thing. So this is just a, a styrofoam container from uh, the deli department. Again, they've cut holes in there, put the rock wool cubes in there, and then you could put this on top of your nutrient solution again in a, a 10 gallon aquarium. If you have a spare aquarium, you could get a, a plastic storage container. Uh, something like that um, as your reservoir for your nutrient solution. So next slide. And then here's a little bit more of a, a commercial setup. Um, so you can see here again, they've got those large pieces of styrofoam again floating on top of those those reservoirs that they have that nutrient solution. And you can see those are tightly packed in together. So again, they're not getting that, that light into that nutrient solution. Uh, so they're kind of trying to reduce algae growth that way. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, next system we've got is our ebb and flow system. So this is a, an active type, um, and we are going to be recovering the nutrient solution for this. Uh, so this one, again, we have our reservoir with our nutrient solution in it. There's going to be a pump in there that's going to pump up that nutrient solution up into a tray um, above or, or some kind of something holding those plants above it. Um, and then um, it'll then recycle that nutrient solution uh, back down. So we can have... Um, there, this is going to be on a timer and a cycle, so you may have something like you will uh, pump up that nutrient solution for five minutes, let it drain for 10 minutes, um, maybe sit for 20 minutes, and then and then flood again. So this is kind of this constant um, flooding and draining of that to provide that water and that nutrient solution. Um, when this when the system is flooding, there's going to be an overflow pipe, so that basically you're going to have a set level of that nutrients, and then anything extra is going to drain back down into that reservoir. Uh, before you fully drain it. So next slide here, we've got a, a picture of that. So it'll make a little bit more sense than my crude description there. Uh, so you can see here on that on the bottom of that picture, they have an aquarium and off to the left of that aquarium is their is their pump. Um, pumping that nutrient solution up to that reservoir on the top, you can see those PVC pipes off to the left. So that that pump is pumping that nutrient solution up into uh, that top part there with the plants. Uh, I think those are a little clay. Um, pellets that they've used for that uh, in that front right corner that is the overflow area so again when the nutrient solution gets up to a certain height it'll start flowing back down um, and again that, that, that ebb and flow so it's going to pump that up and then let it drain back out uh, through there in this particular one they're growing peas so you can see they've, they've provided some support um, or peas or beans and they've provided some support to those plants uh, so they can grow up that uh, next slide And this next slide, we just kind of have a little uh, picture here, kind of diagramming all that a little bit easier to see some of the stuff. So again, that reservoir with that pump, pumping that up into that top tray, uh, letting it fill up and then draining back down into that reservoir. And and that's going to be on a timer to, to kind of cycle through that system uh, on its own. So you're not having to do that manually. Uh, next slide. Next one we've got is um, NFT. You may have heard NFT in the, the news recently um, this is not that kind of nft this is nutrient film technique um, so again this is another active uh, recovery hydroponic system you know, so with this again we have our reservoir with a pump in it um, and that is going to pump that nutrient solution up and that's going to uh, wash over the roots of the plants so the the plants are going to be um, in some kind of grow tube a lot of times they look kind of like gutters on a house and basically that nutrient solution is going to be pumped up there and it's going to wash over those roots um, of those plants in that uh, that tube. Um, and this is going to be constantly constantly running, or there may be short times where it's not, but it's going to be pretty consistently running. So this is one, if if you were to lose electricity, um, you know, this system is kind of 
it's kind of bad news if you run out of, if you lose electricity in the system. Uh, so next slide. Um, so like I said, it can be kind of unforgiving. Um, there are there is no growing medium that those those plants are in. Again, those those roots are suspended. They're down in that um, gutter. So there's nothing to kind of hold on to that moisture. So again, you lose electricity. Those roots are going to dry out relatively quickly. Um, you're going to get wilting rel relatively fast, and then potentially death um, of those plants. So probably not the system if you've never done hydroponics before. Probably not the system you want to start off with. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here's a, a setup here, um, kind of a kind of a homeowner type setup. So they've used PVC pipe. And you see here they've cut holes in there. They put their pots um, again with some kind of maybe a perlite or vermiculite in there. Um, that blue storage container is where they have that nutrient solution. So again, that is pumped up um, into those pipes, and those pipes are at a slight angle, so that will flow down. And again, you can see those tubes underneath. Um, that excess nutrient solution is uh, captured and then returned back into that reservoir. Uh, to be used again. So just continually cycling through there. And uh, again, they've got grow lights set up. Uh, and you can see those plants are a little bit leggy. Um, so they probably need to provide a little more light there uh, to prevent that legginess on their plants. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so back in a former life, um, I used to work at Disney World um, at the hydroponic um, uh, gardens at, and in the land at Epcot. Um, so this is their NFT um, system that they have set up. So with these, they're basically using um, gutters. And again, this is lettuce they have growing in there. So those lettuce plugs are in um, those gutters. There's a top to them with holes cut in it. Again, those roots are laying in that gutter and they have that system um, recirculating those nutrients uh, throughout uh, that system. Uh, so next slide. Um, and you can see here a little bit closer up with that. So again, they have that top on there that those plugs fit in. Um, and this is just kind of a, an example of success, succession planting. Uh, so you've got your 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 kind of your newer stuff uh, going from kind of the, the top of that picture down so that recently planted probably a few weeks later, and then you're, you're fully mature, ready to harvest uh, lettuce there in the middle. So next slide. Um, so this is my last slide here. So this last one is going to be aeroponics. So again, another type of hydroponics system. Uh, with this, your plants, um, again, are, are in the case of this A-frame on the side there, that's some kind of plastic A-frame that has the plugs of those plants in there, and those roots are hanging down into the inside, suspended in the air. Um, and with, th with this system, there is a pump and mister setup. So that, again, this is going to be on a timer. So this will go off periodically and miss the roots of those plants. Um, so you can see that in that in that uh, diagram on the right there. So again, if you do something like this at home, you could use a, an aquarium, um, a, a a plastic storage container. Again, you're going to put the those plants, cut the holes in the, the lid of that storage container, put those roots in there, and then you're going to have a pump and a series of misters in the bottom there that will then periodically bathe those roots in that nutrient solution uh, to provide them with the nutrients they need. So with that, I'll turn it over. To Katie. Yeah, so now that we know about the different hydroponic systems, we can look into some of the different growing mediums that are available that we can use in the systems. So in the past few slides, you've seen rock wool, which is one that is commonly used. Rock wool is made of lava rock. It is heated spun like cotton candy and then shaped into bricks or cubes, and then it is cooled. During this process, it makes about 95% more pore space, and then that gives it a water holding capacity of about 80%. Uh, so in these hydroponic systems, we definitely need that water holding capacity. Another positive about rock wool is it does come in very varying sizes to accommodate for uh, germination through maturity. So there's smaller cubes as well as larger cubes that you can use through that those different growth stages. Another one that you're probably familiar with is perlite. So this one comes from lava flows. You're probably familiar with perlite from the little white balls and potting soil. It's very light, spongy, and it holds three to four times its weight in water. It's also good for water holding capacity. Again, good for our hydroponic system. Vermiculite is another one that can be used. 
It's very similar to perlite in its texture. It does hold minerals closer than rock wool or perlite, which can affect the salt level of your system. Uh, so we don't want too much salt held close to the root system as that can burn our roots. Another thing about vermiculite is it may contain asbestos. So you definitely don't want to use the insulation kind. And it's not uncommon to do like a 50-50 mix of perlite and vermiculite. Um, so that way you have the best, best of both worlds. Another option that can be used is coconut core. So this is just ground up coconut palm husk. It's used as an alternative to peat moss. It does have good air holding capacity and it retains moisture well. It has good pH, which is slightly acidic. Um, and this pH can help level out the, the pH of like your nutrient solution. Coconut core, as I mentioned, is a potential sustainable product. Um, it's something that once we're done with it, we could potentially add it to our compost systems. Uh, it's not something that we would just need to throw away. Another option are the expandable clay pellets. These were used in the ebb and flow system that Ken had previously shown you. They are expensive, which is one downfall to these, but they can be sterilized between plantings, which makes them good at preventing the spread of diseases in your systems between harvest. Um, so that's one positive of using those as well. Here are um, some pictures of the different growing mediums that you could possibly use. It's also, it's always nice to have an idea of what they are. So this one here is the perlite um, that you're probably familiar to seeing in your potting soil. Coconut core, it comes in a block like this. Uh, so you can just add some water to it and then it kind of shreds apart. And so that uh, is how you would use that. You have vermiculite here and the expanded clay pellets. Um, with a rock wool here, it does show the flexibility of how you can use rock wool and the multiple uses of it. So here in the back, you can see it's used in a raft system. Um, and then you can go into an active system where this is probably has some aeration going on as well. And then here we have it um, in somewhat of a wick system. So they've planted the rock wool in the perlite um, to create the the wick system there. For starting your seeds in a hydroponic system, you can use seeds or, or you can use transplants. If you have something small that you want to put into your system, you can do that. You can also use cuttings. If you're looking for a way to root your cuttings and keep them extremely moist until they develop those new roots, um, putting them in rock well is probably a good option. One thing about direct seeding, as you can see in the photo, is direct seeding right into rock wool uh, helps you to avoid any root disturbance. So if you recall, rock wool is pretty porous, so the roots are going to grow into the cube. If there's ever a time that you want to transplant that plant with rock wool, you would simply just pull the cube out and put it right into the pot and plant it. So that's a benefit um, with using the direct seeding method. There's no major disturbance um, when doing that. As for water, you already probably know this, but plants need water to thrive. And in a hydroponic system, water is even more important. Mature plants process a surprisingly amount, large amount of water. Tomatoes are one of our more commonly grown plants in hydroponic crops. A fully grown tomato can use anywhere up to two thirds of a gallon of water each day. So we always tell people that if they're going to do this and if they're passionate about growing in hydroponics, that good water is key to the system. You'll wanna make sure that you get your water tested. Even if it's city water or well water, um, you wanna make sure that there's not any additional nutrients in that and that um, your pH is correct. Light is also essential for plant growth, and the amount of light is going to vary depending on what kind of plant you're growing. For most food crops, such as corn, tomatoes, and peppers, you're going to need about um, 8 to 10 hours of sunlight a day. If you're going to be growing more of your foliage plants, they can survive on less light. 
Is this something that you are going to do as a hobby? Then you can put this in a window and you might not need to provide it with additional light. Temperature is also important to consider. It's going to depend largely on the plants that you're going to grow. So we have our warm season and our cool season crops. For warm season food crops, they do best in a temperature of um, 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Some examples of our warm season crops include tomatoes, peppers, and basil. For our cool season crops, these generally require about 10 degrees Fahrenheit less in temperature. So we're going to be looking at a temperature between 60 to 70 degrees during the day and 50 to 60 at night. And an example of our cool season crop would be lettuce. We also want to think about air. So our, our roots need um, air in order to grow and thrive. So it's also important that we would be adding air to our system. And so that can be done through an air stone. As for nutrients, we have 17 essential nutrients for plant growth. A good way to remember that. But of our, our 17 essential nutrients, there are three uh, non-fertilizer elements, which include carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. These plants or these nutrients plants are going to get from ca their carbon from carbon dioxide. They also get oxygen from the carbon dioxide, and they're going to pick up hydrogen and oxygen from the water. So with those three, you don't necessarily have to worry about supplying those in your nutrient solution. Of the other 14, um, we're going to get those from the nutrient solution. So our primary macronutrients, you're all probably familiar with this, but they include nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. These nutrients are needed in larger quantities by the plants. We also have our secondary nutrients, which include calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. These are also still important, but they're not needed in as high of quantities as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And then lastly, we have our micronutrients, which plants use in much smaller quantities, but they're still important for plant growth. And these micronutrients include iron, manganese, boron, molybdenum, zinc, copper, chlorine, and nickel. Of the 17 essential nutrients, each of them play an important role part in plant growth. Uh, they benefit us in things such as um, cl building chlorophyll, providing cell structure, or activating enzymes. So it's important that we provide these to the plants. For our nutrient solutions, these are the elements that are needed for growing in our hydroponic system. They're often available in a Premix form that we can find at our garden centers, uh, oftentimes in our garden catalogs. If you're looking at a hydroponic system, at buying one, oftentimes they're also going to advertise the nutrient solutions with that as well. So that's an easy way where you, where you can find this information on where to buy it. They're often complete uh, fertilizers, so it's it's going to provide you with all the nutrients that you need for your system. I would recommend following the recommended rate on the label. So a lot of times we think more is better um, or we want to cut costs, uh, but that's not a, not a great idea. Uh, we always want to follow that label. It's, it's there for a reason. And then you would consider replacing your nutrient solution every two to three weeks. In addition to our nutrient solution, we're also going to want to um, discuss our pH of the system. In hydroponics, we're primarily concerned with the pH of the water used to make up nutrient solutions and to irrigate the plants. pH is a measure of the relative acidity, um, and it's on a 0 to 14 scale, where 0 is more acidic, 7 is neutral, and 14 is most alkaline. Um, on the next slide, I'll discuss uh, some information on where, where we need to be with our pH of our system. We also want to discuss EC. So EC is electrical conductivity. It's the concentration of nutrients in our solution. So 
um, oftentimes our nutrients are salt. So they come in a salt form, but they're just dissolved in the water. Therefore, it is um, important that we're measuring this. Here you can see is an easy way to measure that. So it's a, a little handheld machine. You can just stick it in the water and it will tell you your EC. And sometimes it'll also tell you the pH of the water as well. Um, so in our system, we want to make sure that we are keeping our uh, solution anywhere from 5.5 to 6.5. If you need to adjust this, there are ways that you can do that. Um, if the solution is too alkaline, so if our pH is greater than 7, you can add a few drops of white vinegar. Um, if it's too acidic, again, if our pH is below 7, then we'll add some baking soda to that water uh, to get that pH up to where we need it to be. And then you'll want to continue rechecking this. Uh, after you make the adjustments, you can take a new measurement and that will help you to reevaluate where you need to go. This is a nice chart um, that shows uh, the relationship between nutrient availability. So along the top of the chart, we can see our different pHs. And then here in the chart, we see our different nutrients. So as our pH gets lower or higher, we can see that um, nutrients become less available or more available. So this is why pH is so important. Typically, when we um, what we want to achieve is anywhere, oops, apologize for that, anywhere in this range around a 6.2 is where we would like to be. As you can see that most of our nutrients, our macro and micronutrients are available at this range. So now that we have all this background information, we can get to work on putting together our own homemade system. Sorry about that. For materials, you'll need a plastic storage container. This can be something that's just laying around your house. You may choose to use a deeper container because the deeper the reservoir, typically the more stable our nutrient solution will be. Fluctuations in nutrient concentration and pH are more likely in smaller containers. One thought I thought was it would be pretty cool to use a a clear container for this as we can see what's going on inside of our container as we're growing. But this is actually a bad idea as it allows light to penetrate and that will promote algae growth in your container. So it's best to use an opaque container. You'll also need some net pots to hold your media and plants. And then finally, you'll need your air system, which includes an air pump, air tubing, and air stone. Here you can see they're cutting the holes in the top of our lid. Um, so you're going to trace the bottom of the net pot rather than the top. You can either use scissors or probably a hole saw would work best for this. Um, but you want to make sure that you're tracing the bottom so that way the net pot doesn't just fall through the container lid. You also want to plan the spacing of your holes to accommodate for the mature size of the plants that you'll grow. You'll put the Rockwell cube in the net pot and then the seedling into the cup, and then you'll set those in the lid. Next is our air pump system. So the air pump system will remain outside of the reservoir. Some pumps will come with a check valve. This ensures that the pump does not suck water back up if it's turned off. If it does not come with one, you must keep the pump above the water level. Connect the air stone and the check valve with the length of tubing, ensuring the arrow on the check valve faces the air hose, or sorry, faces the air stone. Then connect the check valve to the air pump in the same manner. So here you can see you can cut a hole in the top of the lid, and then that way you can feed your air tube into your air stone. When it comes to filling your container, it can become pretty heavy. So you'll want to make sure that you have your container in place before you fill it full of water. You want to fill it full of water, leaving about one to two centimeters of space at the top. And then next, you can put your hydroponic nutrient solution into the water. 
making sure that you're following the instructions on the bottle. We'll also need to adjust the pH of the water using a pH meter. So measure the pH and then adjust as needed. In this example, they planted lettuce. As it grows, your lettuce plants or herbs or whatever you decide to plant in your system will grow on top of the container. And then here you can see the roots will dangle down into the container. It's very important to ensure that the water level doesn't drop too much, especially when the plants are young. Uh, you want to make sure that it has the roots have sufficient contact with water, ensuring that they will grow well. Throughout the uh, growing cycle, you also want to monitor your pH levels and your nutrient levels to make sure that you're providing the proper levels for your plants. In this example, they're growing lettuce, and you can see that it's doing really well. And then here, um, we have some herbs that are also doing well. So there's a lot of different options that you can do for growing plants in your hydroponic system. Ideally, if you're if you're new to hydroponics, uh, I would suggest starting small, something that you can easily manage and that you're comfortable with because it does take some maintenance. Um, and especially being new to something, it's always good to start small. So here are some great resources that you can use on your adventure in hydroponics. Um, there's a presentation here that was um, something that was done previously. And then the hydroponics, a practical guide for the so soilless grower is a great resource as well. So this program was originally created by one of our co-educators, Bruce Black. If you have any questions, you can contact him. Over the years, we've modified it. Um, and so Ken and myself are providing you with this information today. So feel free if you have any questions to reach out to us.